everyone, welcome. Before we get started and I start introducing tonight's uh, speakers, we're going to just kick it off with a raffle. It's very exciting. So I'm going to ask my friend Cheryl to draw for the first prize. Okay, you ready? It's um, two, three, seven, five, one, four. I'll say that again. Two, three, seven, five, one, four. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you All right, kidding? Great work. <laughs> We talked about him winning the raffle. I told you you had a winning face. <laughs> that is bizarre. We literally talked about it and I walked in the door. <laughs> That's excellent. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out this evening. Welcome to Darien Library. My name is Erin Shea, and I'm the head of adult programming here at the library. Just like to briefly mention that programs here are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make events like these possible. I also wanted to thank a few people that were very instrumental in making this evening possible. The first is Pat Tone, our audiobook guru. <laughs> She's our audiobook buyer, our audiobook evangelist. If you ever need your next audiobook uh, recommended for you, Pat is the one that you want to see. I would also like to thank Cheryl Herman and Brian Nielsen from Random House. They're here this evening. There's Cheryl. She was our raffle puller. And there's Brian right here. Uh, someone said that he must be important because he's wearing a suit jacket. So you can tell that he is, in fact, very important. We're very grateful to them. They were the ones who donated our raffle uh, this evening, so we're very excited. So now I'm going to introduce our guests for this evening. From the days of reel to reel to the soaring popularity of digital download, Dan Zitt, Vice President, Content Production for the Penguin Random House Audio Publishing Group, has been on the front lines of the evolution of the audiobook industry. During his 18-year career as a producer, Dan has been the creative catalyst for over 1,000 audio productions, collaborating with best-selling authors, notable celebrities, and award-winning narrators. Twelve of his recordings have been nominated for Grammy Awards, with former President Bill Clinton's autobiography, My Life, winning the award for Best Spoken Word Album. He has directed President Clinton three times, as well as directing former President George W. Bush, and most recently, First Lady Michelle Obama. With the merger of Penguin and Random House, Dan will oversee the production of 750 audiobooks this year. Our next guest, so six-time Audi nominee. <laughs> I was really afraid I was going to pronounce that wrong. Uh, it's Audi, like audiobook, not like Audi the car. Uh, nominee in multiple earphones and Parents' Choice award-winning producer, narrator, and writer, Tavia Gilbert has appeared on stage and in film. Library Journal said this of the highly acclaimed actress, as close as you can get to a full cast narration with a solo voice. She has narrated more than 250, I think she actually told me close to 300 uh, since this bio for her was written, multicast and single voice audiobooks. A few of her most recent narrations are Blue Plate Special, Mothers, True Love, and a Darien Library favorite, We Are Water. And our third guest. He is a two-time Obie winning stage actor who was the first American actor to play Mozart on Broadway in Amadeus and appeared in the 2009 revival of Brighton Beach Memoirs. His films include the, the Born Legacy, W, and Batteries Not Included. And he also is in the first 15 minutes of Crocodile Dundee, too. And I told him that I was going to include that in his introduction. <laughs> Dennis's transporting voice can be heard on over 125 audiobooks. He's the recipient of six audio awards given by the Audio Publishers Association. And nine of his recordings have been given audiophile earphones awards, including Neil Gaiman's American Gods 10th Anniversary Edition, Philip Roth's Nemesis, John Grisham's The Litigators, and Stephen King's Firestarter. So please join me in welcoming them to Darien Library. Talking about how we kind of got into this industry. Um, once again, I'm Dan Zitt. 
I'm the Vice President of Content Production for Penguin Random House Audio. As was mentioned, I've produced over a thousand audiobooks, um, adult and children's audiobooks in my career. Um, and the next year we will be producing somewhere between 750 to 800 books. Um, obviously, I don't do this all myself. Um, we have a team of producers that I oversee. So uh, Penguin Random House has three locations at this point, two in New York City, one in Los Angeles, uh, where we have 10 producers. Seven in New York and three in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, we have eight recording studios. Uh, in those studios, and if any of you are ever in Los Angeles, please come down and get my card after this, and I would love for you to come by and just see what the studio is like. It's one of the best creative spaces you can ever be in, because you can walk into one room and listen to someone re reading a Robert Caro book, and then walk into another room and hear someone reading a John Grisham book. So it's one of the best spaces you can actually uh, enter. Um, so we have 10 producers. What is the producer's job? Um, a producer's job is to be the liaison between the author and the process. So from the very beginning, we get a list of titles, us 10 producers, then we go into a steel cage and distribute them, a lot of blood and fighting, and then we figure out what we actually want to work on. Um, and after we get our list of titles, we go back to our caves and we start reading the way editors read their books when they first get manuscripts from authors. Um, and after we read them, when we've actually figured out how to have an intelligent conversation with an author about their work, um, we put the phone and call them and say, hey, I'm Dan Zitt, I'm the executive producer of your audiobook. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about the voices in your head. We're going to say it that way, but um, that's basically what we're asking them. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about an author, uh, you know, and why the kind of Random House way of producing books is a little bit different from some other publishers. A few years ago, I picked up the phone and called um, an author that will remain nameless, because he may even live in the same room, um, and said, hi, Jeff. Um, it's, not yeah. real, it's not his real name. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Jeff. It stands it from Random House Audio. I'd like to talk to you about your audio book. And he said, nothing. I said, Jeff, are you okay? And he said, well, Dan, I have to be honest with you, I'm shocked. I've had three audiobooks produced in the past, but I've never heard from anyone from the publisher before, so I'm a little shocked. And I said, well, why is that shocking still? He said, well, after the first recording was done, I hated it so much that I called the publisher and said, what have you done with my book? I want to talk to the head of production. Please don't hire that actor again. I said, okay, and I hung up the phone and then they publish the next two books with the same actor. <laughs> <laughs> so, getting back to what the producer does, we don't actually do that. We like to pick up the phone, and the first thing we like to do is say, you know, what, what are you hearing in your head when you're actually writing this book? And that can be a little scary when you're on the phone with Stephen King because he's hearing different voices. We don't want to know about. Um, but the job is to really collaborate with the author, um, whether it's one voice or multiple voices, or it's the author themselves who often want to get into the studio and read their own book. Um, and sometimes authors will get in there and say, well, why am I doing this? I can't believe I decided to do this. Um, so after we have that conversation, we to go back to their little caves and they start to think about the casting and what the author really expects out of this audio book. And we start picking the brains of each other, all the other producers, and then start calling them the agents for actors like Dennis Pizzi Paris and say, you know, I need someone who can do a German accent, but can also play an eight-year-old boy who's French. <laughs> Anyone on the roster? <laughs> um, and agents will call you. And so it can take a while. Uh, some authors, you know, I have an author on the listening library list, the children's list that we have, named Liva Bray, who um, said, you know, I want to come up and have a meeting with you. And he sat in the boardroom at a random house. And we sat there for about an hour talking about the 40 different voices in the book uh, for her book, The Dividers, where we had an 85-year-old African-American male from New Orleans and a 16-year-old girl from Ohio and a bunch of kids from New York in the 20s. And how are we going to make that all work? I said, well, we're not just going to pull someone out of a hat. I think we're going to have auditions. So we brought in over a two-day period. 20 or 30 actors to come in and not just read <coughs> three pages, 
let's read 10 specific characters that we were really concerned about. And then we whittled them down and edited them. And then we sat down, I sat down and listened to it. And said, this is the person. And then sent them to live up and just looked at them and said, please let her pick the same person I did after you know, 20 or 30 auditions. And she agreed. So by doing due diligence with the author and spending this time collaborating with them on the casting, most times you're going to get the best product and the best audio production. Um, and of course, your author is then behind the product, which is more important than anything for a publisher. Um, so after we've actually figured out who's going to read these books, uh, the next job of the producer is really to figure out who's going to be in the room with the actors. Um, because it's not simply you know, calling a guy off the street and saying, I need you to work with Dennis. Although we've done that with Dennis. <laughs> Um, it's really about putting the right director in the room with the right talent um, and someone who's going to know how to navigate the waters of working with actors, whether uh, they like to work for 40 minutes and take a break and then stare out the window for 30 minutes and not being, not just kind of pushing them into a place where they're going to be uncomfortable. And the actors to my right and left will talk more about um, what it's like being in the studio, but um, finding the right director match with the talent is a really important part of that. So we have a slew of freelance directors on both coasts that we spend time uh, training over years and uh, they've locked many hours. Um, I have producer friends who've produced and <coughs> directed over a thousand audiobooks. So after you block that many hours, uh, you get pretty good at the job. Um, after we found the right director, we try to we give the director the book and say, listen, I know I've spent all this time on the phone with the author preparing finding the right talent. Uh, now it's time for you to go through it with a pen and start to find every pronunciation in that book that you are a little bit uneasy with, or that the talent actually might be a little bit uneasy with. And as the director actually goes through, they create these long lists of pronunciation um, that we can sometimes run by the author. So most times we'll call the author and say, how do you say this German word? And they'll say, I have no idea. I just read it in the book. Good luck. <laughs> um, but most of the time, authors do have a lot of those pronunciations in their back pocket. So they'll spend some time on the phone with the author going through these long pronunciations. And when they can't find a pronunciation that an author uh, doesn't have, they pick up the phone and they start calling embassies or libraries in the local neighborhood that they're trying to find the right pronunciation of the town. Um, and I know this only because when, I, when we make a mistake, and usually I find out about this when I go to library conferences because librarians are always the one that come up to me and tug on my neck and say, I need to talk to you about CD4, track six. <laughs> and I pull out my business card and I say, let me write this down. Um, you said my town's name wrong. And I say, oh, what do you call the director? Well, we just kind of winged it on that one. Oh, we don't do that. We don't wing it. Proper pronunciation, pick up the phone. Um, so the director's job is really to spend a lot of time finding those pronunciations, creating binders of these pronunciations, so that when Dennis says, "How did we say that? How did, you know, what's that name again?" Give it to me. Let's go. Let's keep moving this along. Um, so everyone should be prepared in the studio. In the studio itself, typically the actor is in a uh, in a booth, soundproof booth. On the other side of the glass, there's an engineer there listening for everything they ate that morning. <laughs> um, there stomach noises or um, whatever. Um, strangely enough, your bodies make way more noise than you would think. And the microphones are so sensitive that it picks up every little thing. Um, and then there's a director who's sitting there, as I said, with a binder of pronunciations and hopefully uh, prepared to move forward with the actor on actually recording. Um, as they start recording, I will leave that conversation up to you guys on what that actual process is. Um, and typically, for an audio book, it takes about a full day to get about three finished hours of audio that's edited audio. So now that we're in a world where unabridged audio is so important, um, you could be in studio. Dennis, you were just in studio for how long recording the book? Five days. Five days, mm -hmm. which would probably end up being about 15. Half an hour. <laughs> Dennis has a lot of takes. Yeah. <laughs> takes a lot of takes. Very particular about that town name. <laughs> he spent 45 minutes on chapter one. It was actually 400 pages. 
so five beta is over 400 pages. Uh, so after they, they've actually completed the recording, it's sent to someone who I like to picture, I and mean, I know many of the other editors would hate when they say this, but I would picture someone in their basement surrounded by tons of CDs um, to do the most tedious job in audiobooks, which is to take out every bad take that, that has been made over the course of the recording session and piece it all together so that you can have one complete audio program. After it's actually edited at Random House, we actually send these things to a third party, again, someone else is probably sitting in their basement, um, in head, with giant headphones, listening for the smallest stomach noise, or the one time that you pronounced Fred Freed accidentally, um, to find every little mistake that may have been made post <coughs> Um, and then they would send it back to the editor to clean everything up. So by the time it actually gets to the replicator, where we have CDs, it's been listened to two or three times. And then when it's actually at the replicator, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard about this, but we do this around, we have those CDs sent to another person who hasn't touched the project to do one last check to make sure that there's not something that just went a little bit off and transferring something digitally or a track that got dropped or something like that. So by the time it gets, hopefully by the time it gets out there, there's not a flaw in the entire program. Um, I think that's pretty much it. That is the process from a random house, from a random house standpoint. I think, um, Tavia, you want to talk a little bit about how you got started in this business? And then sure. And I'm going to move the mic so that the chair isn't actually pretty Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Um, I love telling the story of how I got into audiobooks. Um, I was an acting student in Seattle at an arts conservatory, and I was originally from Idaho. So one, I think I was going home for spring break, maybe. It was about a seven or eight hour drive, and I had my Dodge Neon cassette tape player, and I thought, this is a long drive. I'm going to go get an audiobook. I had read aloud to my mother, who has pretty severe ADD, so she's, she loves to read, but she has a really hard time concentrating, focusing to read. So I had read to her through, even into high school, so I had loved that. You know, it wasn't an art form to me, it was a hobby to me at that point. Um, but I went to the library and I got a book that was narrated by Davina Porter. If you're audiobook listeners, then you know her, she is, I think, magnificent, just, I could not have had a better example of an exquisite narrator. So I put the cassette tapes, you know, the first cassette in my car, and Davina's beautiful voice came reading, a, I think it was a Joanna Trollope book. And I had been very passionate about the voiceover work that, I, or the voice work that I was studying as an acting student, but there was something about being read a story that just grabbed me, and my eyes filled with tears, and I thought, I want to do that. I want to do that forever. Um, that was probably in the late 90s, and uh, then it, you know, my career developed, and I happened to get uh, make a connection with somebody who happened to be a casting director, and he gave me my first audition. I was so nervous, and I booked my job my first audiobook job, he called me about two hours later and left a, a voicemail and said, give me a call back. And I thought, oh, I'm fired. I haven't even recorded any. <laughs> um, I called him back and he said, I have another book for you. So I had two books and he kept me employed for a year and seven years later I've now recorded almost 300 titles. So wow. I've been very, very fortunate to have booked that much work and to be, I read across the genres, so I've done a little bit of everything and Audiobooks has been great. So um, I'm looking at the list of things that I have been invited to talk about. One of the things that I have done that I don't think a lot of narrators have had a, an opportunity to do is to direct and produce titles as well. So I haven't done a lot of it, but I've done about, well, I mean, I guess 30 is a fair number of multicast productions. I've worked with um, kids from six years old all the way to my friend who's in his 70s. And that's a different process. It's a little bit different uh, product that I'm putting together, multicast recordings of classic literature and plays. Um, 
I've done quite a bit of Shakespeare and some young adult titles, some, um, and then classics. So I've been really fortunate to have a pretty broad range of work, and I love I, I'm just, I love hearing about you producing because there's nothing. <coughs> producing a book is so exciting to find when you know that you found the right voice and you're you've just perfectly cast the role. It's just such a great, satisfying job. Working with children has been incredible. I got to direct Anne Frank and cast a girl who was about 14. And she came in so prepared and so passionate and so committed to the work. And she was just effortless to record. And then there was the time that I cast somebody who did a fantastic series of auditions and then was a disaster in the studio. And in that case, I had to really figure out how to do, direct an inexperienced, talented young woman. And in that case, after about an hour, I said, I'm just going to feed you every line. So it was an uncomfortable day, but it, the end product was great. She was directable, and, uh, and we, we figured out a way to make it work. So I'm sure that you have many experiences where you figure out as you go along what that particular production calls for and what needs to be done in the moment. Um, we spend a lot of time auditioning actors in Los Angeles and in New York, just because obviously, you know, casting, there's no cookie cutter approach in certain companies. Put a cookie cutter approach on it. It's like, well, it's Southern, Paul Bill, he's from Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to take place in Texas. And people in Tennessee are getting mighty angry when they hear that Texas accent. <laughs> um, and just because you can act doesn't mean you can read. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. And that's all I'm going to say tonight. There's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, that's actually a, a couple of years ago, we were working with a celebrity on a book. It was a title that had just started in the morning, and I went down at noon to go say hello. And as I walk out to the studio, the actor, who, if I mentioned him, everyone would know, was rocking in the in the hall, looking down. And I went over and introduced myself and said, are you OK? And he said, I can act. I can't do this, though. This is so hard. It's a very difficult thing to do. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. I think I. I think it is very difficult. I'm really glad that I seem to have a natural affinity for it. I, I think. I, people keep casting me, so um, and I hope they don't stop. Um, but even harder than narrating for me is writing. And I got my master's degree in creative nonfiction. Uh, just finished that degree about a year and a half ago. And I, I do write. It's um, a less developed part of my career than my work as an actor so far. But I really am so glad that I took the time to study writing at that level, because another thing that is perhaps unique to my career is that I have a, a deep understanding of the writer and how uh, not only the nuances of the craft of writing, but the vulnerability of being a writer. I've had so, I, I develop relationships with writers as often as I can and more and more as my career develops. And they all express, no matter what genre or uh, if it's fiction, nonfiction, children's or adult literature, it's a very vulnerable act to put yourself on the page and to have a relationship with a publisher who respects the writer, that's a, that's a rare thing. You've, you've already exemplified that that's not the standard. But writers want to hear their books produced in audio the way they feel is true to the voice that they've crafted. Um, and it's a pleasure to find a beautifully written book and to feel like I know, I know just how to handle that material because of my training as a writer. There's a book that I narrated several years ago called Lamb. It's a very very dark book. Um, and it's there are some sort of buried in secrets that the writer very skillfully planted. And it was really exciting to pick up on them quickly. And then to fully exploit those opportunities in audio. If you're a close reader, you would have certainly gotten them reading them on the page. But a, a, another narrator might have missed those opportunities because 
they were very subtle. And I think she was working on a level that reached your subconscious. So that's something that's really beautiful about audio, that the audio experience can really, it gets into something at, a, at the level of DNA almost. There's a, a different experience hearing a story. I'm a, an avid reader still, and I will always read on the page, but there's something really um, visceral about hearing a story in your ear. The audiobook listeners know this experience and know the intimacy of hearing somebody, a human voice telling you a story. There's sort of, I've experienced sort of, you feel like you fall in love with that person a little bit. Um, and there are people who have told me a story, you know, Davina Porter, I will always be just a little bit in love with Davina Porter because she, her voice has transported me through storytelling so often. So when I finally got to meet her, and I had a martini, and uh, <laughs> she walked up the stairs, and I started sobbing, and said, it's because of you that I have this career, and I'm just so grateful, and I just really appreciate it. <laughs> she said, take your time, Dan. <laughs> Cry. <laughs> <laughs> she certainly deserves that level of um, being, you know, feeling that she's beloved because I think we do love the storytellers that we love. I think that's. Is there anything I'm missing? <laughs> I think a story, you know, one side of the story that I'll tell with regards to that is um, Stephen King once said at some point, he was reading his audiobooks early on in his career, and at some point, I think he was unable to narrate uh, one of his books, and someone named Frank Muller, who's no longer with us. I'm sorry. I was very afraid that I was going to lose my voice yesterday. I called Cheryl at 9 p.m. She's like, shut up. Um, I was telling the story that Stephen King um, used to read his audiobook several years ago, back at the beginning of his career. And at some point, he couldn't narrate one of his books. And after a narrator read it, and it was someone named Frank Muller, Stephen King gave him the greatest compliment I've ever heard an author give a narrator, which is, now when I write, I hear Frank Muller's voice in my head. So talk about being transported by a voice as supposed to write it. What did he do for Ron McClarty? Didn't he, didn't he love one of his kids? Yeah, Ron McClarty uh, wrote a book called Memories Running uh, a few years ago. And Ron McClarty had been reading, narrating books. He was an actor in television for many years. And he had uh, written a book called Memory of Running, but he couldn't get it published anywhere. And he decided that he was going to uh, send a copy of it to Stephen King because he had worked on one of Stephen King's audiobooks. And Stephen King wrote an article in Entertainment Weekly about the best book you've never read because you can't read it you can only listen to it. And eventually Ron sold his book and many books after that because of that article. But Stephen King is a great um, friend to the audiobook industry because of uh, <coughs> the business for a long time and he had some of the first audiobooks I ever listened to that for sure. So, Dennis? Where am I? <laughs> So, uh, I heard this story, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but there was this symposium uh, early on when books were books on tape. And there were a lot of them were recorded at AFB. Did you ever record at the Foundation for the Blind? Uh, I'm your time. Well, I recorded it. Yeah. And uh, so the symposium was about the future of um, books on tape. And somebody in the back of the room said, well, it's great what you're doing for the blind, what are you doing for the deaf? And the guy said, what are you doing for the deaf? It's called books. <laughs> it's all about books. It wasn't books, it wouldn't be Jackie Collins. So um, uh, I got into, I, I feel funny about this, because I got into the audiobook business in a whole other way. Um, and I've done, I haven't done this, I've done about 140 titles at this point. Uh, from Stephen King to uh, Philip Roth to um, a, a book called Getting to Yes uh, to a Harlequin romance, which uh, uh, which actually took place on a pirate ship. 
<laughs> and, and, and I actually, four pages into this Harlequin romance, I stopped and to the person who threw the bus said, who, who downloads this? And they said that the biggest demographic of people who downloaded it were truck drivers. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever you see a Walmart truck weaving on the road. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I've done all of these titles, but I, I started uh, because uh, Simon and Schuster, way back when, was doing a title called Before and After by Rose Ellen Brown. Mm. And uh, it had a, two narrative voices. It had a, a man and a woman. Uh, the man was a Jewish artist and the woman was his wife. They got Kate Milligan to read the woman. And at the time I was doing an off-Broadway play called Sight Unseen. Uh, and I was playing a Jewish artist. So Simon and Schuster, wow, I'm a Jewish artist. So they hired me and I had no idea what I was doing. And the producer said to me that the important thing was if you're paying attention to what you're reading, we'll pay attention to what you're reading. And I've, I've always thought that to be true and I, I, I try to follow that even because every time I start a book, I feel like I've never done it before. This is the first time. So, um, and one of the things, I mean, he said that when you go, you go into this small booth, it's like a confessional, actually. I mean, it's that small a lot of the time. And the thing that you learn is that your stomach makes noises that you had no idea. Okay? I mean, and you put some kind of pillow over it. Um, so there's that. You so learn to have a little yogurt. The, the preparation for the book, I, you know, the preparation would be to read it. And this seems obvious, but not to me. I'm a person, I don't wait to the last minute, I wait to the minute. And um, uh, I was given a book, like the third book that I was offered way back when, and I didn't bother reading it. And the night before, I well, I better look at this. And it's a book that will remain nameless, Inadmissible Evidence. And, um, <laughs> and uh, it took place in the Cuban community in Florida and the Puerto Rican community in New York. And I am not very good at accents, so I was, uh, I mean, it's horrible of me. I, um, all of, it all sounded like Jose Jimenez. And I, um, I actually, today I downloaded the review that I got for that book that says here, some of the female witnesses sound the same and some do not sound like women. <laughs> So that's a book you may want to look away. Actually, I found another review that I got, which said the novel is worthy of four stars, but the narrator struggles with Hebrew. His Yiddish is incomprehensible. He's, it's outrageously. His rendition of Jewish American colloquial English is not much better. The audiobook is all but unlistenable. He, the publisher should never have released this vocal shambles. I got an audio award for it. <laughs> When I prep books, I you know I, I check to see if there's accents because I'm not very good at them. And then pronunciation. Now I was just listening to a book, a great book, which I would suggest that you read and not listen to, uh, by Mark Harris. Is this he publishes Mark Harris? Uh, it's a book called Pictures at a Revolution. It's about uh, the five Academy Award nominated movies in 1967, and that Mark Harris uses this as a jumping off point to show how Hollywood was changing. And the reader pronounced Sidney Lumet's name. This is a, the, the, one of the greatest movie makers of the last half of the 20th century, a person I worked with, by the way. Uh, Sidney Lumet's name is Sidney Lumet. He <laughs> <laughs> pronounced Vogue magazine as Vogue. <laughs> I swear, and Ilya Kazan is Elia Kazan. Oh, no. Yeah. And then there was another one. Instead of a biopic, it was a biopic. <laughs> it was a movie about lens crafters. <laughs> So, so uh, pronunciations. Uh, that's, so that's important to look up. And I was witness to an argument once about P A T I N A. Uh, you know about this? So, so apparently the the reader, who also remained nameless, uh, was very upset because he wanted to say the first pronunciation of the Merriam-Webster dictionary, which is patina. But the producer wanted to, to say patina because no one would know what the hell Patina was. <laughs> so uh, the producer won, but the, the actor called and yelled and said, you're ruining my career. <laughs> so there's that. Um, what did they decide on? Pardon me? What did they decide on? Uh, patina. They forced him <laughs> by the gun to his head with Patina, because you wouldn't know what Patina is. 
the great thing now is that if they don't say it the way you want it, we can just cut it together digitally. <laughs> <laughs> so my final little story is, um, that, and I've done a lot of books I'm very proud of. Um, I, uh, it's the Stephen King's Firestarter, and I did two Philip Roth books, uh, The Nemesis, which is about the polio epidemic during World War II and the human stain. And I did a book that not a lot of people know about by David Denby called American Sucker, which was about him losing all his money in the stock bubble, thinking he was a hot dog. And, and it was a nonfiction book. And I loved the book. And I um, was in LA working on something, and I saw that he was doing an in he was doing an in-store event. So I thought, well, I would go meet him. And uh, he did the reading. He was okay. And, I, and there was, he was like, well, there's a line to meet him. And I'm standing in line, and I didn't really think it through. And when I walked up to him, I said, hi, it's great to meet you. I'm the guy who read your book. <laughs> uh, and he said, uh-huh. I said, oh, no, no, no. Again, nothing. I, I read it out loud. <laughs> and he said, did you like it? <laughs> and then I, 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 was, I felt like an idiot, and I saw so there was a pile of the books next to him at the table, and I, usually there's a picture, you know, that picture that's up there, but there was no picture. It was just my name, and so I said, okay, well, it was nice to meet you, and I went to <laughs> So that's my audiobook history. <laughs> about one of the books that I've done for Random House that's my favorite so far. And it's the funniest way I've ever gotten an audiobook job. <clears throat> I was in a Pilates class in Portland, Maine, where I lived for about 12 years. And there was this girl with this crazy hair, and she was just always just spacey and, and wide-eyed and sort of off-kilter. And I thought, that girl's a little crazy. And there was an article about audiobooks in the local paper, and she came up to me and she said, I'm a writer, and I want you to narrate my audiobook. And I, I was not exceedingly warm to her. I said, that's great. I, that sounds great. And at the I was thinking, oh, please, there's so many writers who write terrible books, and I don't want to record a terrible book. And she's a space cadet. Oh. And she was not, she's Kate Christensen. <laughs> and she said, she's, she's wonderful. I love her. And she said, you're so good at Pilates. I bet you're a great narrator. <laughs> so then she, I was right in the process of moving to New York. She was right in the process of moving from New York to Portland. She thought about reading her own book. And then she said, no, you said it's a confessional. Those, you know, our boots are confessionals, and she said, this is way too close to me. I just can't read aloud these confessional things that I've written. So I got to narrate her book my very first week as a full-time resident of New York. And it was, mm -hmm. we have a great friendship now. And it was wonderful to read her memoir, in which she talks quite a bit about being a young writer and living in New York. And so that was one of my favorite Brandon House projects. It's interesting working with authors in general. Mm -hmm. As a producer, when you first call the author of the person, you're always like, what do they want? You know, like, what are they going to ask for? And I've had authors where I'll call them and say, you know, introduce myself and say, so what are you thinking? What are you, what are you hearing? And say, I hear George Clooney. <laughs> and I said, well, it's a, from the first person perspective of an eight-year-old girl in Belgium. <laughs> yeah, but I really love George Clooney. <laughs> I do love George Clooney, but maybe we can be a little more constructive with the casting. <laughs> um, so that conversation can be that. As a publisher, you always have to be as diplomatic as possible. Um, but getting to the bottom of what that voice is, is the job. Um, I guess I have a good question for both of you. Have you, either of you ever been cast for something terribly? Like you got the book and you were like, why did they cast me? I don't understand it. I mean, you mentioned something earlier. Inadmissible evidence. Inadmissible, <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're aware. Yeah. No, 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 please. I couldn't possibly. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm done more time. <laughs> um, uh, the southern things that take place in the South, I <clears throat> enjoy them. I have a fondness for them, but I don't have any personal connection to the South. I'm from the Pacific Northwest. And 
you know, from the Northeast. So, I, you know, I don't think it's horrible. I, I'd like to think that I have the acting skill and the research ability to make a decent job of it. But. There's just been some books that I just hated. I mean, it's not that I was in this town, I just hated them. These were not Penguin Random House books, by the way. You know, sometimes procedural books. You know that take place, and, they, and you're fighting. You're looking for a crime, and you can, when you read them, you realize the author didn't read his own writing out loud because he repeated the same word six times on one page. And didn't have an editor. And didn't and didn't, and didn't have an editor. Yeah, it was too much hamburger helper. In the book, I, like the book that I just did, the, the author literally used the word phlegmatically, which is a word you maybe use once you know, in your life. <laughs> you know, but this, it was like four times in a chapter, and, and you would always say, at length, at length, the person did such as, at length, she answered, at length, and so I would raise my hand in the booth every time we got to at length. So, yeah, I mean, there's books like that that you just wish, oh, well, somebody, somebody had read this out loud before I'm reading it out loud. <laughs> well, authors, um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to know, sorry, when it says this book is unabridged, does that mean word for word? You are. Yes. You are. Word for word. And that's, again, going back to the idea that, you know, when these, hopefully these things are listened to by several people by the time they actually get to shelf and every word is actually. <coughs> um, you probably indirectly touched on it, but it must be time when you either get a book that wasn't meant to be read, or at least segments that don't work when you really even read them to yourself. Is an awkwardness in language, or certainly going to be awkwardness in saying it. Is that your digital editing, or do you go back to the author? Um, well, I'll tell you a funny story about Peter Benchley, who wrote Jaws. Um, many years ago, I worked on a book with him where he was talking about, I can't remember what it was, something he was supposed to do with sea creatures, and talking about sharks in one chapter and whales in another chapter. And he, he was narrating the book. It was very close to his heart. And he started reading chapter seven. And through about two thirds of the page, he stopped. And I looked at the director. And he's like, Who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> I know I wrote this, but I didn't write it. I couldn't have written it. <laughs> call my editor. We're cutting the book. We're cutting this out. I cannot believe this rubbish is even. <laughs> Did, was that true? Did he? He cut out of the book. Wow. Um, this is one thing you'll notice with authors overall. Like, they will get into the studio, mm -hmm. and they'll be editing their book <laughs> while they're in the studio. And in fact, there was an author on the list, I can't remember his name, who decided that he wanted to read the audiobook before they finished the final copy of the editor that was getting shipped to the printer because it was a good way for him to, to self-edit. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the editor is calling us going, come on, guys. <laughs> Please don't let him make another change. And I'd say, it's President Clinton. I'm not going to talk. <laughs> 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 the best writers read their work aloud as a process of writing and revision. So you can tell, I mean, I've narrated many books that I've loathed. And it's an uncomfortable thing. But bad writing often comes from writers who don't read aloud their work. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure on their side to actually make Sometimes bad books really interesting. Oh, yeah. I mean, reading a 400 page book about Six Sigma or a business practice can be exhausting not only for the reader but for the listener. So, <laughs> if you can keep someone interested for a 400 page book of audio about business process, um, you're doing something right. But everything is written from a place of passion. So, even if it's seeming, seemingly dry on the page, a, a good actor, a good sensitive reader will will find the heart of the person who wrote it. There was a reason they were committed to writing 400 pages, so that's where you go. Yeah, I uh, personally, I wrote a nonfiction book on creativity. It came out in uh, 2012, and Stephen Hoy um, yeah. did the, the audio. Well, I, at first I was sort of pissed and shocked that they didn't talk to me, they didn't ask me, because I thought I could narrate this thing. But it was an incredible experience listening to him read this thing with such import and such authority. I mean, he did a, a thousand times better job than I, as the author, ever, ever could have done. 
So I thank your industry for improving, you know, the author's works. Well, the right. question the question actually comes up at every event I ever speak at. So what happens if the author wants to read and you're not too sure about that? <laughs> and you know, there are publishers who will say, well, we'll let the author audition. I think that's a terrible idea. I mean, this author's worked on this book hopefully for many years at this point. And now you're going to say, well, if you come in and you have the right voice, you'll hear it. You're, you can read your own book. Um, what I like to do with authors is give them options and say, listen, I know you want to read this. Before you decide to jump into a studio for five days and you say, what was that word? Patina. Patina? Pat um, why don't I audition a few actors? And then let you listen to the auditions, and then all of a sudden, and 99 times out of 100, an author is, what was I thinking? I never should have thought about that. You know, why, am I, why would I ever think of it? This guy is perfect. This is, this is the voice of a book. Do you use multiple readers on books? Sometimes. We do. Sure. We do. Um, we don't do, I've worked on quite a few books where we've done almost what I would call radio dramas yeah. um, on the library, on the children's side. Um, but if a book, you know, for instance, Gone Girl, which is a bestseller, comes from two different first-person perspectives, if, it, if that's the way the book is written, we will hire uh, multiple readers. It just let, last week, we hired eight readers for a book because the book was between someone who had taken seven people captive in each chapter was a chapter where the actor, where the, uh, the captor, so to speak, the captain. And during that time, we actually took both actors and put them in a the room so they could kind of play off of each other. So you really get acting, as opposed to someone reading all the lines and then us up just putting them all together. Um, so where, where, where the shoe fits, we certainly will do that. I worked on a multicast of uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, book, American Gods. And I was the narrator, everybody else's characters. So I was alone in the room. So basically I was going, and then he said, he said, <laughs> she looked at him and said, <laughs> and then he said, I was really good. And then you can listen to like Jim Dale reading Harry Potter and say, where does this man come from? What planet is he from? And where can I get the rest of those audio uh -huh. yeah. Before we take the next question, I think we should do another raffle. Tonight, you can still be a semi smaller winner because there's lots of awesome uh, audiobook samples outside for the taking on your way out. Okay, continue. <laughs> I was a radio announcer in the Army, and my only training was not to pop my keys because the air would blow out the microphone. Uh, I, I wonder, and I haven't done it since, uh, what would be your advice for a young fellow like me to get in the trade? Maybe you could scope out the, the spectrum of voiceover because you are at the very high end with actor training and probably I would be at the computer repair manual stage. But how do I get into this, this business uh, myself? You know, there are a lot of publishers now. I mean, you know, compared to 15 years ago or 18 years ago when I started doing this, you know, you had the major publishers producing audio and then you had recorded books who produces audio for the, for the library market. Uh, produce audio for the library market. Now, there's you know 50 audio publishers: Isis Audio and Oasis Audio and uh, Hantor and you know any number of publishers out there. Um, I think publishers are looking for talent, and you know Tavia might be able to tell you a little bit more on how to kind of break through. But from a publisher standpoint, you know I don't call agents for every single book I cast. Um, 
you know, I work directly with actors on them a lot of the time. They're a professional audio book narrator. I think the best way to kind of break through is to get, I hate to say it, it sounds like you know, a cliche in this business for us, but it's like, get your demo together. Find out what you're good at and, and go with it. And, you know, I'll, I will say that, you know, figure out what your strength is and start there. Um, there's a lot of actors who, over the years, who, who were non-fiction actors, who said, oh, I'm really great at fiction but they never read a fiction book. But the only way they got to that point was starting with reading 20 nonfiction books. And then all of a sudden the publisher said, you know, I'm gonna take a chance on you for this book. Um, so getting a demo together, I mean, one thing you can do at Random House is we have an inbox at Random House called narrators at randomhouse.com where we ask narrators to send uh, their auditions and the producers curate all of the content in there uh, to find new voices. So that's, 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 that's narrators. <laughs> 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 stop, go back, start again at the top of the line, read for an hour, do that for three weeks. And then if, if, you're, if you continue to have interest, then pursue it. But I think that that's a, that's a pretty decent test and not a lot of people would do it because that doesn't sound like a lot of fun, right? Um, but I think that that's a good way to sort of test your stamina and, and see if it really might be something that's for you. There's an organization called the Audio Publishers Association, and they put on an annual conference, which is in New York at the Javits, the beautiful Javits Center, uh, <laughs> on May 28th. And you go to audiopub.org. You can register for the conference. That's a great way to just get acclimated to the industry, meet people, narrators, producers, casting directors, and um, and get some education, a little bit of direction. And then I think before you do a demo, getting specific audiobook coaching. There are great coaches, a lot of people in New York, people who coach over Skype or the phone. And um, it's a specific craft. So even if you're not coming from a specific acting background, you may have a great talent. And uh, even if you've been in film or on stage for 30 years, you may not be able to do it. So every person is an individual and has, you know, is bringing their personal toolbox of skills, life experience, voice, tone, and range, and ability. So who knows? You could be absolutely fantastic and not even know it yet. And one thing to note is there's a lot of content that has to be recorded. Uh, the audiobook industry, year by year, is just producing more and more and more. 18 years ago, we were doing three-hour abridgments of books that were 400 pages, so figure a quarter of the book. Now everything is unabridged, so that means actors are in the studio a lot longer, um, and there's a lot more publishers, so there's a lot more audio product being published. Dan, um, the lady in this second row there, I think, oh. has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. How do you, how do you decide what books are going to be Narrate. Um, so we at Random House, Penn Random House, we have a 50 plus team of people. We have a, we're probably the largest audio publisher in terms of just how many people we have working with us. And on that team is uh, four people that are essentially editors. And their job is to work very closely with not only the hardcover imprints within Penguin Random House to find the books that are suitable for what we do on audio. Um, but also uh, to go out to other publishers and find the hidden gems that haven't been published on audio by the Simon and Schuster's of the world or uh, other the Scholastics of the world. I mean, Harry Potter was published by Scholastic, but Penguin Random House published and Listening Library published the audiobook. So we have people that their job is to find the right titles and select them based on, you know, will they sell? Are these? Is this suitable for audio? Any number of things. I've, I've just noticed that there's a there are a lot of books that come out that I really want to read, 
and they're not on audio. And, uh, and that's why I asked that question. Um, you know, something that's supposed to be, we'll say, a National Book Award book. Have you, have you checked audible.com? A lot of times it's just not in a physical. It could be in yeah. audible.com. What are you saying? Yeah. It's, a, it's a website called audible.com. Yeah, but I can't see it. So that, that's not oh. good for me. You can have someone to look for you. I mean, they yeah. would. Do you listen with physical with CDs or do you listen with an iPod? No, I listen to the CDs. CD. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are many titles now that are not available on CD because there's not really many places to put them these days. As we know, you know, book public, you know, Knowledge and novels of the world are hard to find. Borders no longer exist, so there's not many places where you can buy CDs. Amazon, obviously, you can buy CDs. So, people, partners like Audible uh, and Overdrive and companies like that are selling our products that you may not see on CD digitally. So you can download them to your phone or to your iPod or to whatever MP3 player you're using, and then listen to them that way. Which I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. It, is that when you say this audible.com, is that when the voice voice comes in plastic? No, it's a way to download books onto your computer and then transfer the files to uh, whatever you would listen to it on. It's not a physical CD. And they tend to have pretty much everything, even if it's really badly done. I mean, I mean <laughs> well, I'm going to be very honest, I mean, they, they're a little slipshod. But, I mean, you hear stomachs crowd. <laughs> you know, let's put it that way. And sometimes pages, pages turning. Yeah. And sometimes repeated, actually, whole sections that they forgot to edit. They don't have very good quality control. But that's what it's for. So you download it. So that would be, if when you're looking for a title that you can't find in the library, that would be the best place, really, to go. Uh, but at um, Penguin Random House, we do almost everything still on CD. And libraries, by far, are the best place to get CDs. Yeah. They have much bigger shelf space. They curate it. Um, bookstores have long since really, I mean, a lot of bookstores now, they sell toys. I mean, they, they just switch their direction away from books. And that's why libraries are great, great partners for publishers, because it's where you walk in and you get literally everywhere you're looking is a book. Whereas opposed when you're looking on a computer screen, you're only seeing five books, 10 books. But you get the experience of books when you come to a library. So if CDs, uh, our biggest supporter of CDs are definitely still libraries, and we're really thankful for that. Unless you get the library. And you get the library. Yeah. 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 Are you able are you able to remove a lot of the unwanted sound after the record? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean digital technology has helped us so much uh, in audio. I mean, 18 years ago, when I first started in the industry, I remember I started at Penguin, I worked there for three years. And when I first got there, there were these reels stacked up on my desk where they were taking reel to reel, and what they would have to do to edit it was cut it physically and hang it up on a wall and then put it all together and tape it together. And then you've got a three hour audio book. I mean, I probably, if we were still doing that, I would not be sitting up here. <laughs> um, but digital technologies, we're at a place where, as I said before, if you said the name Fred 400 times in a book, and then you accidentally said free and nobody caught it and it got to QC, the editor can literally just find one of those versions that fits the sentence, plug it in, and you would never know. Wow. I mean, most listeners have no idea what's going on behind the scenes, whether it's just compressing things so that, you know, if you're, you know, there are some actors who record in their homes that don't have home studios, and Tavia has a home studio, that are, you know, a while ago recording in their closets. And, you know, you might hear a cat Meowing somewhere in the background. <laughs> and these days with digital technology, you can kind of look at the file on your computer and the, the engineers can just kind of squeeze it together and make it so you don't hear any of that low end noise or any of that high end noise and just you can hear what you want to hear. I mean, I think as a producer and when we listen to, when we look at quality control notes, the thing that I'm always most concerned about, and we'll get notes where like, oh, I'm hearing a stomach noise here, I'll tell them to send me the file. If a listener is going to be driving in their car and go, what was that? <laughs> then we've made an error. Or they're just going to veer off the road. You know, if we've made an error, uh, someone has to clean that up. So, you know, we often will bring actors back. You know, Dennis just finished a 15 or so hour book. It will be edited and undoubtedly, he'll get a phone call and say, we've got 
point of pickups, we gotta get them uh, come on because there's some things we just can't fix in post production. But we're not relying on it. I mean, I know part of my job, what makes me somebody that casting directors and producers want to bring back in is that I make as few mistakes as possible. If I hear a stomach growl, I'll stop myself. And I want, if it takes most actors a full day to record three hours, I want to be the rare actor that can record four in a day so that Dan will bring me back 10 more times next year. So even though digital technology makes things much more efficient, you're still hiring the actors that are sensitive and, and make the most of your time and money. And if you're making all the right decisions at the beginning of the process, doing the preparation, making sure that the author is on board with what you're actually going to do with their book, making sure that the director and Dennis or Octavia are discussing the approach to a certain character, when it all comes out from the edit, it will, for the most part, be clean, and the things you'll have to pick up aren't tiny things. You just, you know, someone uh, upstairs from the studio dropped a book on the floor, and they kind of seep through the book. <coughs> we can't really do it because it's in the middle of a word, but it kind of will upset the, narrative, the listener because it's in the middle of a really important scene. So let's just bring the actor back and pick it up. But, <coughs> so. If I could just interrupt for a second, we would love to hear the narrators do a little reading before we continue with the Q&A. That's okay. That's okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> would like to go first? <laughs> what? I don't want to follow you. So, <laughs> I don't want to follow you. Why don't we read at the same time? <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Tavia is not going to be. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That was actually Dennis. <laughs> That's Dennis. Yeah. That made you a lot of money, <laughs> This is uh, from a book called Miss Scarlet School of Patternless Sewing. Um, <laughs> and it's the first book that I ever recorded for Random House. Um, and I don't think a lot of setup is needed. That there is our our heroine is Scarlet, and she has been whisked away to New York to attend uh, a gala event. Um, so I'll begin. Johnny cleared his throat. Tell me, Scarlet, have you ever attended a red carpet event? He asked as they rode across Manhattan to the Ziegfeld Theater. Not unless first Fridays in downtown Phoenix counts, Scarlet joked as she straightened the long cream velvet shawl around her shoulders. As long as you stick with me, we'll make it a night you will never forget. Scarlet's gaze latched onto the monstrous marquee that was mounted to the top of the Ziegfeld Theater. She whipped her iPhone from her silk pouch, snapped a photo, and uploaded it to her blog. Johnny clapped his hands and asked Scarlet to concentrate so he could repeat the etiquette rules to her three times. One, she was to stay on his arm and was forbidden to speak no matter what. And two, if he tapped her arm once, she was to break away and stand approximately two steps behind him. She politely agreed. Scarlet would tell her future grandkids about the experience of the next moment. The driver opened the limo door, Johnny Scissors popped out, grandstanded for the hundreds of fans and press, and waved his arms in the air like a champion. He then turned to help Scarlet out of the vehicle. Doing as instructed, Scarlet didn't move or talk. Even when a reporter shoved a microphone into her face and asked her name, she paused. Johnny's hand appeared out of nowhere and shoved the mic away then signaled for security to guide them to the front of the theater. Two uniformed men tugged open the heavy copper gates. Scarlet and Johnny passed through and waited until the, doors until the theater's doors closed behind them. Stay here, Scarlet, Johnny ordered. I'm going to the men's room. Don't move. Yeah. Sure. Wow, that was Natsola, she laughed. She inhaled to catch her breath and watched as the theater doors opened again. Her stomach tightened when she saw Eva Allegria and her crew enter. That Johnny Scissors made me another piece of crap dress, 
she shouted from inside her entourage, uh, entourage circle. Where is he? My gown ripped in the same spot as last time. I easy. I have my emergeso fast bonding adhesive. I can fix it right here, or we can meet in the ladies' room, Scarlet said. That is, if your guards will allow it. Eva signaled for her crew to stay put, and she followed Scarlet. Scarlet stayed calm as the petite Eva Allegria shouted obscenities about Johnny and paced in the bathroom in her black body shaper, diamonds, and skinny slide-on stilettos. Johnny sucks. His designs are outdated, and he must have blind monkeys stitching his stuff, because every time I wear something of his, it fails. This is the last time. She paused in her pacing. Scarlet said calmly, Come here and step into your dress. Let me button it up and then tell me what you think. If you don't like it, I'll change it back. Eva put it on, faced the full-length mirror, raised one arm up like a flapper, twirled, and kicked up her spiky heel. Wow, it looks like a new dress. What did you do? Eva squeezed her waist. I'm astonished. Scarlet, you saved my night. Johnny is very fortunate to have found you, but girlfriend to girlfriend, be careful. He's a cheater and a stealer. I, I mean business-wise. Don't tell him any of your secrets. Now, time to get back out there. Thanks, girl. Scarlet exited the room first to clear space for Eva's grand re-entrance. The paparazzi had made their way inside and bombarded her with photos. Scarlet stepped aside and watched adoringly until she felt an iron grip on her elbow. She turned to see Johnny, flames of fury dancing in his eyes as he tugged Scarlet away to a quiet corner. You broke every rule. The car is waiting for you out back. Leave immediately. He shut up when he heard Eva Allegria talking about House of Tijeras to the TV cameras. Smile, but don't speak he whisper shouted, as they breezed across the theater's atrium. Eva elbowed herself away from her bodyguard and pulled Scarlet into the frenzied circle. I accidentally ripped my Johnny Scissors dress, crawl crawling out of my limo. I'm a klutz, Eva lied. Scarlet repaired it and made it even better using her mad design skills and her emerges so adhesive. Visit her website, it's fabulous. The reporters then turned to Scarlet for a response. There was only one thing she could think to say. Hi, Mom and Dad. I love you. Watch those keys. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I have to unfold this. This is from um, a book of short essays by Chuck Palahniuk called Almost Hi <laughs> called Almost California. The infection on my shaved head is finally starting to heal when I get the package in the mail today. Here's the screenplay based on my first novel, Fight Club. It's from 20th Century Fox. The agent in New York said this would happen. It's not like I wasn't warned. I was even a little part of the process. I went down to Los Angeles and sat through two days of story conferences where we jerked the plot around. The people at 20th Century Fox got me a room at the Century Plaza. We drove through the studio back lot. They pointed out Arnold Schwarzenegger. My hotel room had a giant whirlpool tub, and I sat in the middle of it and waited most of an hour for it to fill enough that I could turn on the bubble jets. In my hand was my little bottle of mini bar gin. The infection on my head was from the day before I was going to Hollywood. I was getting flown to LAX. So what I did is run down to the Gap and try to buy a pumpkin colored polo shirt. The idea was to look Southern Californian. The infection was from not reading the directions. Right on the tube of the magic brand men's debilitory, it says in all caps, do not use with a razor. This is even underlined. The infection was not the fault of the package designers at Magic. So fast forward to me sitting in my Century Plaza Whirlpool tub. Water rushes in, but the tub is so big that even after half an hour, I'm just sitting there with my gin and my shaved head with my butt in a little puddle of warm water. The walls of tub are marble. They're chilled to ice cold by the air conditioning. The little almond soaps are already packed in my suitcase. 
<laughs> the check from the movie option is already in my bank account. The bathroom is lined with huge mirrors and indirect lighting so I can see myself from every angle, naked and wallowing in an inch of water with my drink getting warm. This is everything I wanted to make real. The whole time you're writing, some less than zen little polyp of your brain wants to be flying first class to LAX. You want to pose for book jacket photos. You want for there to be a media escort standing at the gate when you get off the plane. And you want to be chauffeured, no, not delivered, but chauffeured from dazzling interview to glittering book signing event. This is the dream. Admit it, probably you'd be more shallow than that, but probably you'd want to be trading toenail secrets with Demi Moore in the green room just before you go on stage as a guest on the David Letterman show. Yeah, well, welcome to the market for literary fiction. Your book is about 100 days on the bookstore shelf before it's an official failure. <laughs> After that, the stores start returning the books to your publisher and prices start to fall. Books don't move. Books, books go to the shredder. Your little chunk of your heart, the first novel you wrote, your heart gets slashed 70% and still nobody wants it. And then you find yourself at the gap trying on pastel knit shirts and squinting when you look in the mirror. So you look almost good. Almost California. There's the movie deal to support and your hope is now that will save your book. Just because a big publisher is doing my first novel, that doesn't make me attractive. Lazy and stupid come to mind. When it comes to being attractive and fun to be around, I just, I can't compete. Stepping off the airplane in Los Angeles with my hair sprayed and wearing a salmon colored polo shirt was not gonna help. Having the publicist at the big publishing house call everybody and tell them I was attractive and fun was only gonna give people false hope. So the, the only thing worse than showing up at LAX ugly is showing up ugly but showing signs that you really tried to look good. <laughs> You gave it your best effort, but this is the best you could do. Your hair's cut and your skin's tanned, your teeth are flossed, the hair in your nose is tweezed, but you still look ugly. <laughs> You're wearing a 100% cotton casual knit shirt from The Gap. You gargled, you used eye drops and deodorant, but you still come off the plane missing a few chromosomes. That wasn't gonna happen to me. Mm. The idea was to make sure nobody thought I was even trying to look good. The idea was to wear the clothes I wore every day, to re remove any risk of failed hairstyling. I'd shave my head. Now, so this wasn't the first time I shaved my head. Now, most of the time I was writing Fight Club, I had that blue shaved head look. Then, what can I say, my hair grew back. It was cold. I had hair when it came time to take my book jacket photo. Not that hair helped. Even when they took my picture for the jacket, the photographer made it clear the pictures would turn out ugly and it was not her fault. So I left all the new colors of polo shirts, including pumpkin, terracotta, and saffron at the Gap, and I went and didn't read the directions on the tube of men's depilatory. I frosted my head with the stuff, and I started to hack at my scalp with a razor. And the only thing worse you could do is get water mixed in the depilatory. So I ran hot water over my head. Imagine your head slashed with razor cuts and then throwing lye on the cuts. <laughs> Tomorrow, I was going to Hollywood. That night, I couldn't get my head to stop bleeding. Little bits of toilet paper were stuck all over my swelled up scalp. It was sort of a paper mache look with my brains on the inside. <laughs> I felt better when my head started to scab, but then the red parts were still swollen. And the blue stubble of hair started pushing up from underneath scabs, and the ingrown hairs made little white heads that I, I had to squeeze. <laughs> It was, the elephant man goes to Hollywood. The people at the airline hustled me on board first like a, a donor organ. When I reclined my seat back, my scab stuck to the little paper headrest cover. After our touchdown, the flight attendant had to peel it off. This probably wasn't the peak experience of her day either. This is why I write. The infected head thing just got worse. Everyone meeting me looked legendary, like all the guys were JFK Jr and all the women were Uma Thurman. At all the restaurants we went to, execs from Warner Brothers and TriStar would come over and talk about their latest project. This is so why I write. Nobody made the mistake of eye contact with me. They all talked about the latest buzz. The, the producer for the Fight Club movie drove me around the Fox back lot. We saw where they filmed NYPD Blue. I said how I didn't watch television. <laughs> this was not the best news to let slip. <laughs> we went to the Malibu Colony. We went to Venice Beach. The one place I wanted to go was the Getty Museum, but you have to book an appointment a month in advance. So this is why I write, because most times your life isn't funny the first time through. Most times you can hardly stand it. So my head would just bleed and bleed. Whoever was lowest at the pecking order, I had to ride in their car. 
they showed me their concrete hand and footprints and they stood off to one side discussing the grosses for Twister and Mission Impossible while I wandered around the same as the rest of the tourists with their heads bowed looking for Marilyn Monroe. And they drove me through Brentwood and Bel Air and Beverly Hills and Pacific Palisades. They left me at the hotel where I had two hours before I had to be ready for dinner. So there I was, and there was the mini bar just asking to be violated. And there was a bathroom bigger than where I live. And the bathroom was lined with mirrors. And everywhere, there I was, all naked, with eruptions on my head, finally drawing clear liquid, and the little hotel gin bottle in my hand. The gigantic bathtub kept filling and filling, but never got more than an inch deep. All those years you write and write, and you sit in the dark, and you say, someday a book contract, a jacket photo, a book tour, a Hollywood movie. And someday you get them, and it's not how you planned. Then you get the screenplay for your book in the mail, and it says, Fight Club by Jim Yules. And he's the screenwriter. And way underneath that, in parentheses, it says, based on the novel by you. That's why I write, because life never works except in retrospect. And writing makes you look back. Because since you can't control life, at least you can control your version. Because even sitting in my puddle of warm Los Angeles water, I was already thinking that what I'd tell my friends when they asked about this trip. I'd tell them all about my infection and Malibu and the bottomless bathtub. And they would say, you should write that down. <laughs> Oh. 
I think that's going to be an accounting problem. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's a contract between the actor and the publisher. This is a sort of a nuts and bolts question, but I've noticed that recently on uh, books on tape, they sometimes have a track that's 25 minutes long, uh, 15, 18 minutes long, and maybe only three or four tracks to each uh, CD. And I wonder what would be the motivation behind doing it that way, because if you're driving and you get distracted, you want to cut back a, a couple of uh, yeah. clicks, yeah. and you, know, you have to run back 20 minutes. I can tell you what the motivation is for. I mean, we don't. We actually don't publish that way. It's moolah. It's all about money. Um, when we get to the mastering uh, part of audio, a lot of publishers, and you know, our Penguin Powers actually did this because they would cut. You know, look, we're, we know audiobooks are going closer to the digital market and less into hard media. Cassettes are gone. CDs are still around. Who knows for how long? Hopefully forever. But um, it's basically, it just means that they only wanted to master something for the digital market, so they probably broke it into these larger chunks so that the digital partner can take it, but didn't really think too much about the CD consumer. Uh, we, we break everything for CDs. So five to seven minute tracks, uh, what we call Red Book Standard across the board. Uh, because again, for the user experience, it's important. I know, I mean, I listen a lot in my car, on my, on my phone, and it will drive me crazy. If I, sometimes you lose focus as a listener. And if you hit back and you're 30 minutes back to where you started, that's a terrible experience. Well, the adult attention span is only seven minutes. So that's, that's it. <laughs> so really it's about someone not wanting to pay an engineer to master it more than once for multiple uh, vendors, basically. But this is follows up on sort of on that question. Some CDs have, they'll say, this is the end of disc one, please go to disc two, or whatever. And some say nothing. All of a sudden, yeah. you know, there's dead air. And you think, well, right, uh, it's time to, you know, make the disc. I, I, I can feel that. We, we don't do that because that adds something to the book. And it's it's just something we've, we've just never done. Certain publishers do. but. Um, as many people seem to like it, that many people don't like it, so we've just stuck with how we've always done it. Oh, yeah. Do you work with actors of all ages, or do most of them fall into that middle category and they imitate younger or older? No, I mean, I think, I think like we said before, I mean, there's no cookie cutter approach to it. So if you were to be in LA and pop into our studios, you'd see Arthur Mori, who's you know, in his late 60s, and Danny Campbell, who's in his 40s, and uh, Jesse Bernstein, who's in his 20s. Um, it really is just about finding the right voice, and we don't care how old or how young um, I produce the book, or in some cases, how experienced, depending on what you're trying to find. Years ago, I produced an audio book, a full cast audio, and it was a book by Walter D. Myers, and it was called Monster, and the protagonist of the book was this young boy who had supposedly robbed a convenience store in the Bronx, African American. And I must have brought in 25 actors from agents. And every one of them were wrong. I mean, it got to a point where we just, we said we're never going to finish casting this. And finally I said to the director, let's call a school in the Bronx and just bring in a bunch of kids. Now let's find a 14 year old kid who is this boy. And all of a sudden, Ten kids walked in, and we found this kid, and he had never read a book before, but it was the right voice. So that's what we were really looking for, and that's what we found. So we will go far and wide to find the right voice, regardless of age. We have time for just one more question. Um, how long does it take to create a book from the time you s decided you're going to do a book until you actually publish it? And do the authors want you to hurry up, or? or no, I mean, I think the authors just want it done right. So, you know, really, at the end of the day, I, it, it varies. And I'm sure that you both have worked on books where it's there's no big hurry. We can do this over, you know, some weeks. And then there are books like, you know, when we, were, when we uh, recorded Fifty Shades of Grey, it was kind of a groundswell of like, hey, you guys should be doing this on audio. It's published. And all of a sudden, we were like, whoa, we need to get out 18 hour, three, like 18 hour plus audiobooks in like a month. And we had an actor in there working all day and working very hard. So 
depending on what the book schedules are, you know, we work behind the book schedule. So we like to record from the final text, and we wait, 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 and sometimes we don't have, uh, we can't really wait. So we start recording, and then we record some changes. It varies. It can be, the turnaround can be very quick, uh, where we can record, Dennis can record a book on one, a three-hour book in one day, and it could be on sale less than a week later, especially with digital technology. On the CD side, it's a little bit more complicated. You need to So it varies. There's really no schedule. I mean, as a producer, you want as much time as you can possibly, possibly have. Thank you so much.